Prepare for a rude awakening. Shalom, Torah fans. This is Michael Rood at the shore of the Jordan River, the Yarden in Israel, with the Rood Awakening Tour of Israel. And we are here to explore the mikvah, the doctrine of baptisms. We have been going through the record in the book of Acts to see about the doctrine of baptisms. And what we have discovered in the New Testament is that we have several different baptisms that are still in force, that are part of the foundations of the faith in the Messiah today, part of the foundation that we read about in the sixth chapter of the book of Hebrews or the book to the Messianic, the letter to the Messianic uh, Hebrews. And so we are going to take you back into the book of the Acts of the Jewish Apostles, and hopefully these records will come alive to where we understand the mikvah, the doctrine of baptism, as it relates to us today. In the 16th chapter of the book of Acts, we read that Shaul and his entourage are praying about where they're going to go next. And it says that they were forbidden of the Holy Spirit to go into Asia to treat, preach the word. And after they were come to Mycenae, the, they tried to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit didn't allow them. And passing by Mycenae, they came down to Troas. And a vision in the night appeared to Shaul. There stood a man of Macedonia, of Greece. And he said, as he stood over him, come over and help us. Now, this shook him up. He saw this man. He looked right into his eyes. And the man said, come over to Macedonia. Come over to Greece and help us. He got up immediately, woke up the rest of his companions, and said, pack your bags, boys. We are heading to Greece right now. And when he got there, it says that he went into a city of uh, Philippi, one of the chief cities in that part of Macedonia. And on the Sabbath, they went down out of the city by a river where prayer was wont to be made. And there was a woman down there. They heard about this woman, Lydia, a seller of purple literally a seller of Tehelet. See, the Romans had forbidden the Jews to have the Tehelet dye from the hill zone shellfish to dye the tzitzit, the blue, in the corners of their garments because this was expressly forbidden because that color purple was only to be used for the Roman royalty, for the Caesar. And so they forbid anyone to have this color. Now, the, the, the Murax truncalis, or the hill zone shellfish, when you crush the hypochondrial gland during the day, it produces a vibrant blue dye that's the color of the sky. But if you crush it at night and the ultraviolet rays do not get to it, then it is the royal purple. And so Lydia appeared to be a black marketeer. And so Shaul, uh, which uh, we, we believe that uh, as it says in the uh, King James Version of the Bible that he was a tent maker, well, we know that that really is kind of a ridiculous concept in this part of the world because tents are not titanium-poled mountaineering tents. They are huge tents made of goat hair, and they're woven on huge looms that take several camels to be able to haul these tents and the poles. They're made by the many wives of Bedouin shepherds. Shaul couldn't have done that being an itinerary, uh, itinerant preacher, but he could be making skenes, which are not tents but personal tabernacles, the talits that were worn. And as he went from village to village, as he went from synagogue to synagogue, and he tied on the beautiful uh, blue tzitzit, then it would make sense that when he heard about Lydia on the Sabbath day, praying down at the river, that he went down to meet her. And when he taught Lydia in her household, guess what Lydia and her household did? It says that they, they all believed. They were all faithful to the Lord. 
And then it says that during that period of time, as they went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with the spirit of divination met them, and she brought her masters much gain. She was running one of these uh, 1900 psychic hotlines in which she would tell people their fortunes. And she was pretty good at it because she was loaded with demonic spirits, and these spirits were familiar spirits. They go around and they find out things about people's personal lives. They know what your grandmother did, her habit patterns, and then they impersonate the dead. They come back in, in seances. This woman brought her masters a whole lot of money, and she was following Shaul around saying, These are the great men of God which show us the way of salvation. Finally, Shaul had had it with this woman, and he... He cast the demon out of her, and when her masters came, she was sitting at, sitting at the feet of Shaul, which means he was teaching her, she was in her right mind. But when they realized that all the demons were gone, and she could no longer tell the future, reminds me of Dion Warwick's psychic hotline. All of her psychics came into work one morning, and there was a chain through the door, it was padlocked, the, they had shut down, they went bankrupt, and not one of her psychics even saw it coming. They all showed up to work the next day, and it was all over with. Well, this is one of these women who, uh, you know, she can't see three feet in front of her face, but when those demonic spirits inhabit her, those spirits will then tell people their future just to get them lured in so that other people get possessed as well. And so what happened when her masters knew that their psychic hotline had shut down, they were absolutely furious. And so they went before the magistrates, rent their clothes, and, and they, they commanded that Shaul, and I believe it was uh, Silas at this point, that they were to be beaten. They put him, they beat them up, they put him in prison, and guess what? When they put him in prison, Shaul saw somebody that was very familiar. It was that I believe that it was a man that he saw standing over that him that night saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. It was the jailer. And when they put those men, Paul and Silas, Shaul and Silas, in the inner prison, the most secure location, because they don't want these men out. If these men escape, it will cost the jailer his life. And so what did they do? Paul, Shaul, and Silas went in and they began praising God and singing songs of praise and they were bloody, they were naked, they were wounded in the middle of this prison. How could they possibly have the motivation to praise the Almighty singing in that kind of environment? Most Christian believers won't sing out loud because they're afraid somebody might hear them. These guys have been thrashed within an inch of their life and they're singing. What in the world is going on? Well, they know that jailer is right there and he's going to hear every single word. And I believe that Shaul saw by revelation that man and knew this is a man. This is a reason we got beat up. This is why we're here. And they began to praise God and to teach and then an angel came and shook the entire jail. The doors went open, and the jailer, when they saw that the men had fled, the doors were open, took out his knife, put the hilt on the ground, and went to fall on his sword to hang himself, just as Judas did. And Judas did the same thing, and that sword ripped him up, and all his bowels gushed out. King Saul did the same thing. This jailer was going to do the same thing. And Shaul said, do not do any harm to yourself. We're all here. We didn't go anywhere. We're not going anywhere. We were sent to deliver this message to you. And he got all of his family together. And that night, they were all mikvahed. Now, Shaul told me, what are the two mikvahs we see here? We see the baptism of of identification with the Messiah, which is also part of their repentance. But we also see the mikvah of suffering, the baptism of suffering, the fellowship of suffering with the Messiah for doing the right thing and still getting persecuted for it, and he was willing to do it. He was willing to suffer this. And this is what it says in the scripture that the fellowship of his suffering is so sweet in the 20th chapter of the book of Matthew, James and John come to Yeshua, not really them, they send their mother in. And their mother comes into Yeshua and, and, and worships him. And he says, 
Uh, excuse me, woman, what do you want? And really, that's the way it reads in, in the original. What do you want, woman? He knows something really stinky is going on. And, and she says this. Oh, oh, Lord, grant that my two sons here, James and John, get to sit on your right hand and on your left hand when you enter the kingdom. And he said, woman, you have no idea what you're asking. He turned to James and John and said, are you able to drink of the cup that I'm going to drink of? Are you able to be baptized with a baptism I'm going to be baptized with? Are you going to be able to handle the suffering and the pain that I'm going to handle? And they said, yes, Lord, we're able. And they said, okay, boys, you're on. But to sit on my left hand and my right hand side, you can forget it right now. That's not even mine to give. See, once you take up the right and left hand to Yeshua, who do you have left? The right and left hand to James and John. Then when those positions are taken up, then you've got the people below them. It says when the rest of the disciples heard this, they were moved with envy. Why were they moved with envy? Because that's the only response a person can have. People are trying to climb the Nicolaitan ladder of success. They're trying to get to the top of the denomination. They want to be the big shots and all these people under them serving them, getting their coffee and their tea, opening the door to the limousine, checking to make sure there are no assassins around them because they're preaching such an important message that certainly everyone's out to kill them. They got their bodyguards up front. Well, he said, this is not the way we're going to do it in my kingdom. I'm the Messiah. I didn't come to be served. I didn't come so you could open up the chariot door to me. I came to serve others. Those that want to be the greatest, get underneath everybody else and serve them. That's how it's going to be done. If you want to do this Nicolaitan hierarchy, if you want to climb the ladder of success, pack your trash, head up north to Italy, and do your own thing. Because we're not going to do it here in Israel. I think that's what it says in one of these ancient texts. Wait. Okay. maybe. Now, so we link in the baptism of suffering that Shaul went through and the baptism of identification with the Messiah. And that Philippian jailer turned all of Philippi completely around. He was the one. Because remember what happened to Shaul. The next day they threw him out of town. He is gone. He's not coming back. But who's there to continue the work? The jailer. And he turns Philippi completely around, and it is the bastion of believers for centuries to come. Now there's nothing left there, but maybe it's your job. Maybe it's yours. I don't know. We're waiting for that revelation to come to where to go. Now, Acts chapter 10, one of the most beautiful scriptures. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band. Klezmer, I don't know what it was, rock and roll, but no, it was a, he was a centurion, a Roman centurion in charge of 100 men. He had given much alms to the poor. He helped the Jews build a synagogue. He was praying at the hours of prayer. And an angel, the angel of Yah, came to him and said, Your prayer's been heard. They've, your alms, your giving to the poor, has come up for a memorial before the Almighty. Now I'm going to tell you to do something. I want you to send for one Shimon Kepha, who's at Joppa. He's dwelling with Simon, a tanner, outside of town where the tanners all live because their stuff stinks so bad and the curing of these hides is so bad you can't have them inside of town. And so whatever he says, you listen to him because I am going to send him and he's going to hear you. And so he immediately sends his servants to Joppa. On the way there, Shimon Kepha, Peter, is praying and fasting. He's up on the rooftop. And while he is praying, then he sees a vision. There is a sheet, probably a tallit is probably what it was, a tallit let down from heaven, and on this tallit were all sorts of disgusting things. There were rats, there were cats, there were sea slugs, there were tarantulas, there were giant white grubs from Australia. And the spirit said to him, the spirit said, 
Arise, Kiva, kill and eat. And he said, Oh, Lord. <laughs> okay, it's many years after Shavuot. I've heard everything you've ever taught, but I have never, ever heard anything like this. I have never put anything common or unclean in my mouth, and I'm not about to start now. The sheep, Talit, rolled back up, went up into heaven. The Talit came back down again. This time it's got cockroaches on it. And his close relative, the shrimp, the cockroach of the sea. It's got lobsters. It's got oysters on it. Now, of course, you want me to say all that the first time. See, the first time I all mentioned delicacies that may not be delicacies to you Americans, but they're delicacies in other parts of the world. They eat these things all the time. They are like the pinnacle. Boiled cat is a delicacy. Oh, maybe you don't like it because you grew up with a different set of standards in America. has nothing to do with the Bible. It's just the standards that you were raised with. You didn't grow up eating tarantula. People do love tarantula. They fix it in with a little tarantula helper. It's outstanding. So now there are cockroaches on this thing. There's actually charred. There, there are pigs on this thing, of all things. There are dogs. There's rabbit. There's squirrel. And again, the spirit says, arise, Peter, kill and eat. <laughs> oh, Lord, I, I'm not going to eat any of this foul stuff. I would never touch that. And then it rolled back up. A third time it came down, and it's even more disgusting. And he says, no, I refuse to eat it. And then all of a sudden, everything is blank. There's not a sound. Heaven is absolutely still. And while he's thinking about what does this mean, he's hungry. One thing he knows, it does not mean to go downstairs, find a cat, which there are plenty of them around, sling that thing up against the wall, skin it, and eat it. He knows it does not mean to eat boiled cat or a pig or a dog or a frog. He knows it doesn't mean that because he never does it, does he? He's sitting there, what in the world was that all about? And then three men stood outside the gate and called for him. They didn't knock on the door back then. They stood outside the gate, Shimon Kiva, Shimon Kiva. And when he heard their voice, he didn't know who it was, but he heard a voice from heaven said, Peter, rise up and go with these three men. Do not doubt anything. Go with them. He went downstairs, he opened the door. Oh my goodness, three Gentiles. They are in military uniform. They are Roman soldiers. They are Gentiles. And he brings them into the house and says, what are you guys doing here? And they said, Cornelius had this vision. The angel of the Lord told us to come and see you. And he said, I wouldn't go with you guys, except the Lord showed me in a vision that I'm to call no man common or unclean. He didn't say the Lord showed me that I'm to eat boiled cat, rat, dog, pig, or cockroach. He said I'm not to call any man common or unclean. The scripture interprets itself. There is no way that these things which are an absolute abomination, they are created by the Almighty to be the garbage disposals on land and sea like the pig is. It doesn't even sweat. It doesn't even pollute the land with its filthy sweat. It, it goes around and it devours dead carrion, carcasses around the land, keeps all that poison in them, and of course, it dies with them. Unless someone is so foolhardy as to kill it and cook it and eat it, and then you're eating all that garbage. God did create some things to be garbage disposals. Right on the side of the catfish, it says, not for human consumption. It does not have scales. If it had scales, you could eat it. Without scales, it says, this is not for human consumption. It's real simple. Now, he goes with these men. He gets to the household of Cornelius, and he begins teaching them. And while he is speaking to these Gentiles, the Holy Spirit falls on them, and they begin to speak in tongues just like he did on the day of Shavuot on Pentecost when they first spoke in tongues up on the Temple Mount. And when Peter saw this, he said, Who was I to forbid water that they should be baptized? 
He would never have mikvahed those Gentiles. Never would he have done it. He would teach them, sure. But even though they, that Yeshua said, you will be witnesses unto me to the ends of the earth, first in Jerusalem, all Judea, Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth, even though that was what was told, yet now, many years later, 15 years later, he finally goes to the first Gentiles and speaks the word, and it's because Yeshua baptized them with the Holy Spirit first, then he knew. God had indeed cleansed these Gentiles. Who was he to say they could not be mechved in water? So that is exactly what he did. Now, when he got back to Jerusalem, of course, he was brought before all the elders, James, and everyone wanted to hear, okay, what's going on here? You went and stayed several days with Gentiles? What is going on with this thing? And so he explained the whole thing, told them the whole background. And when he said that on them, upon these Gentiles, the Holy Spirit fell upon these Gentiles, and they spoke in tongues just like we did on the day of Shavuot when we first believed, and we received the gift of Holy Spirit. And when they received the gift of Holy Spirit, who was I to withstand Almighty God? That's why I mikvahed them. The very obedience, the thing that we were taught to do, to make the people in the water so that it would be the sign of their repentance and their identification with the Messiah, that we are all of the household of faith now. That is why I did it. And they threw up their hands and said, Glory to Yah in the highest, for certainly he has granted salvation to the Gentiles. They weren't circumcised. On the eighth day, they were not circumcised at all. But they were chosen by the Almighty. I believe this book of Hebrews, to the Messianic Hebrews, are to all those who cross over, regardless of the tribe, whether it is Judah, whether it is Benjamin, whether it's Ephraim, Levi, Zulu, Cherokee, Aborigine, that any tribe of anyone on the planet who desires to come to the Messiah is grafted in to the one olive tree, and that is the vine, we are the branches. It would be a pretty boring olive tree. It would be a pretty boring olive fruit around the land of Israel if we only had one type of olive here. Would that not get old after a while? But this is the land which uh, I'm trying to encourage my wife, who doesn't like olives. I said, no, you don't like Spanish olives. Israel is so full of all these different varieties of olives, you can't say you don't like olives because they're so diverse from one end to the other. And that is the olive tree that the Messiah has constructed and put together. The wild olive branches, the Gentiles, and you guys are definitely wild. There's no doubt about it. You are the wildest bunch of olives I have ever seen in my life. And when you are grafted into the sap, the richness of Israel, and that begins to flow in you, you produce a fruit that is so flavorful, it is so unique, it is so un-Jewish, it is so tasty, it is such a delicious morsel. I love going around the Messianic congregations in America. I go to hundreds of them and teach in hundreds of them over the years, and I love it when they are so full of Gentiles because there is a flavor in those that is so unique, that is so tasty, and that is what this is all about. The doctrine of baptisms allows us to leave the past behind at any point in our life and start over. It first of all is purification. And the Almighty knows we all need to be purified and let the past go by. It is a baptism of repentance because we certainly all have something to repent from, don't we? Even after we've come to the Messiah and we've done our best to walk, yet we've done things that need to change, and we know it. So we go into the waters and let it pass over us. Then, the baptism of identification with the Messiah, not a denomination. You will be mikvahed out of every denomination, out of every man-made cult on the planet, because from now on, you identify with the Messiah and Him alone. 
and then the Messiah baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And the fire that he baptizes with is the final point in that he was tempted in all points like we are, he is able to succor them. He is able to succor them. That is an agricultural term. In the fields, you go out and pluck and cut off the unnecessary shoots, the water spots that grow up from the middle of the apple tree, of the plum tree, of the fig tree, that will never bear any fruit. Sure, they got a lot of leaves on it. It looks real neat, but the master knows which ones have to be cut off. And when they're cut off, they're all gathered together and they're burned in the fire. You are going to have to submit that in your own life to your Lord because he's got some stuff he needs to cut out of your life. You think it looks real nice and green. It'll never bear any fruit. It has got to go. And once all that dead wood is cut, it's burned in the fire. That's the baptism of fire. And then you're willing to walk into the valley of the shadow of death to do what he's called you to do, and there is going to be suffering. But the fellowship of his sufferings, to know that you are suffering for the right thing, that is what is going to put your life into, really, the Almighty's hand into the glove of your life to reach out and touch others. This is a time that we present our bodies as living sacrifices. This is the mikvah, the doctrine of baptisms. This is Michael Rood and the Rood Awakening Tour of Israel on the shore of the Yarden, the Jordan, about to go into the mikvah so that the past is done away forever and we are going to follow the Messiah. Shalom, peace. I will see you when the smoke clears.